introduce uh, Bill Bernstein at this point. Uh, William Bernstein is a, an American financial theorist and neurologist. His research, sorry, I'm changing views here. His research is, the, is in the field of uh, modern portfolio theory. He's published several books for individual investors who wish to manage their own stock portfolios. He has authored several best-selling books on finance and history and is often quoted by the national uh, financial media. He's written for Morningstar, Money Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and I'm sure others. His title on the history of world trade, A Splendid Exchange, was shortlisted for the 2008 Financial Times Goldman Sachs Best Business Book Award and uh, was designated a best book of the year by The Economist. In 2017, just a few years ago, he was the recipient of the CFA Institute's James Virgin Award for financial research. Uh, and more importantly for most of us, uh, Bill Bernstein shared numerous fireside chats with Jack Bogle at the Bogleheads conferences. And in fact, you can find recordings of these sessions on the Bogleheads forum. Uh, that, now, uh, Mr. Bernstein is the author of three books that I happen to have, The Intelligent Asset Allocator, The Four Pillars of Investing, and a book called If You Can, How Millennials Can Get Rich Slowly. I'm gonna hawk his books for him because I don't expect him to do so. Here's the Intelligent Asset Allocator and paperback. I think the rest of these I don't have on. Uh, I'll just hold up the titles here. I, I don't happen to have the jackets for these. And I take the jackets off when I actually wanna read a book. So, uh, so today we're here basically to discuss one of those books. Um, the Delusions of Crowds, Why People Go Mad in Groups. Uh, Bill, thank you for coming uh, to our group today, our, and uh, th thank you for attending. Oh, you are mute, muted still. Or if you could unmute him. Okay, very good. I'm sorry about that. That happened. Someone, someone, you need to have someone wearing a t-shirt that says, unmute your, unmute your damn mic. Yeah, really. <laughs> well, anyway, thanks. Thanks for coming. We're, we're really thrilled to have you. Uh, now, I prepared a few questions that I, I actually sent them to you earlier today, but you were probably in another meeting and didn't get them. But that's OK. I'll try to read them loud and clearly. And uh, if you don't like any, we can push back. We have plenty of questions and fortunately, plenty of time to get into stuff today. Uh, one thing I wanted to know, it, it occurred to me, and I, I'm sure you've been asked this before, but you started off uh, as a, uh, a practicing MD, a neurologist, I believe. Uh, and at some point you transitioned or you elected to get out of that and write financial books. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that transition or that journey. Well, transition is, is the right word. Very early in my medical career, uh, it became obvious to me that the major vocational risk of being a physician was burnout. I saw it happen to everybody around me. It's an endemic condition among practicing physicians. And I was, I was aware of it even before I started practice. So I very quickly, after you know, being on call 24 seven for 10 years, uh, began to transition uh, away from solo practice and to getting a partner and cutting down my hours. And over a period of about 15 years, I very gradually cut down my exposure to medicine, which freed up time to do other things. And one of the many interests I picked up was doing financial research and writing about finance. So transition is exactly the right word. Better, even in better words, just a, a slow segue. There was a point in my life when I was fairly busy doing all three things, practicing medicine, also running a financial practice, and also writing about finance and then uh, about, about history. And I've always kept all of those three workloads consciously in balance. Uh, and so now I'm basically uh, uh, assigning most of my bandwidth to, uh, to writing. And uh, you're also a financial advisor and you have your own firm, is that correct? Yes, it's Efficient Frontier uh, Advisors. We've been, we've been closed to new clients for about the past seven or eight years. Uh, so it's a very small practice. Right. 
Okay, uh, well, let's get into specifics now on your book. Uh, again, the title is The Delusions of Crowds, Why People Go Mad in Groups. Uh, and my first thought, uh, most, I think most people would agree with this, they would see your book as an extension or an updating of Charles Mackey's book, um, Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. That's a pretty famous title that bandied about quite a bit. Uh, and that was the middle of the 19th century. Uh, does that best describe your work as an extension of Mackey's? Yeah, it was a conscious extension of it. Uh, I first read the Mackay book uh, oh, uh, around 1992. And I thought it was fascinating, you know, all these people going crazy over religious manias and stocks and medical manias. Uh, and I thought, gosh, this is interesting, but not terribly relevant to me in my life and certainly not to the financial markets of the time, which were reasonably well behaved. And then lo and behold, within several years of my reading the book, the tech mania exploded before my eyes and Mackay's book came to life. And I said to myself, ah, uh, you know, I've, I've seen this movie and I know how it ends. Uh, and it saved, you know, it saved my bacon. Uh, and it turned out that my experience wasn't a unique experience. Mackay had been saving investors' bacons, his readers' bacon for, you know, for more than a century. And very famously, Bernard Baruch read his book in 1907, and it saved him a lot of money, both in 1907 as well as in, in 1929. And Baruch was so grateful that he actually wrote the introduction to the 1932 edition of the, uh, of the book. So I sort of filed that away, a very useful you know, piece of information. Uh, it, it's a famous book in finance just for that reason. Most well-informed people in finance have, have read the book and it's proved very useful to them. So I sort of filed that away. Uh, and then like everybody else, five or six years ago, I was just gobsmacked by the ability of the Islamic state uh, to, um, to attract people to fight and die in one of the worst places in the world, you know, Syria and Iraq. And a lot of these people came from prosperous backgrounds and prosperous Western nations. And I realized that Mackay had also written about that and how that came to happen. Uh, and so I, I realized at that point I had to write a, an homage, a modern homage to Mackay's book and include the neuropsychology behind these manias that we know about now that Mackay didn't. Oh, that's that interesting. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll get into a, a few of those. Maybe you'll elaborate in a, in a minute or two. Uh, and you, you talked about uh, the current uh, Islamophobia or not phobia, but the Islamic mania that took, uh, took place, I guess that was in the, the Middle East or has been in the Middle East for some years. Uh, and that uh, leads to the question of, uh, you in your book, you explore a number of different uh, instances of religious mania, as well as financial mania. You sort of, it's a nice, nice blend of both. Uh, and it's over many hundreds of years, not just current day. Uh, since our focus today will be primarily on the mass delusions of uh, people that are in the financial markets, uh, nevertheless, perhaps you could instantiate uh, one or two of the secular delusions that you uh, write about that impact us as human beings. Well, I'm, 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 uh, I'm cognizant of the fact that Mel Lindauer is, is in the audience. Whenever I would go to a Bogleheads conference and I would venture into politics, which I did all too uh, often, he would shoot me a glance and you know, put his finger on, on a metaphorical ejection button that he had uh, for me. Uh, but since you've asked the question, I, I will you know, observe <laughs> that, that if you want the non-religious, non-financial manias, delusions out there, delusions of crowd out there, they're, they're obviously political. Okay, uh, yeah. you know, they're, they're, you know, and I, I'm not even going to mention what they are. We all know what the big political delusions out there. Uh, you know, QAnon uh, is, is certainly a very impressive mass delusion. And there's a QAnon reprises a strain of more or less secular mass delusion that has its origins uh, in medieval Europe, the blood libel against Jews, the, the Jews, Jewish, Jewish worshipers would drink the blood of Christian uh, babies uh, that they had slaughtered uh, during their religious uh, observances. And that translates in the modern era into the moral panics we've had uh, over um, 
uh, childhood uh, uh, pornography rings, uh, you, you know, the Pizzagate uh, episode. There are people in this country who believe that there are, you know, tens of thousands of babies who were stolen from incubators and slaughtered in ritual sacrifices. Uh, they actually, there are people who actually believe this, including somebody who very nearly became head of the, uh, the FBI uh, about 30 or 40 years so ago. We, we can stipulate then that the, those stories are not true. Uh, yes, it's it's a, the, the idea that there are 60,000 babies that disappear from incubators every year in the United States, but no one happens to notice it uh, does, does strain credulity a bit. <laughs> or that, or that, or that, you know, the, the, there's a pizza parlor uh, in, in Washington, D.C., whose basement hosts ritual childhood sacrifices. Yeah, I, I've never seen it, but I haven't been to Washington lately, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I try to make light of this because we're going to get into some pretty heavy stuff, as does your book. Uh, some of these matters are pretty serious and they have serious consequences. Uh, so my next question, uh, I'm going to dive into a, a chapter kind of in the middle of your book called Briefly Rich, one of my favorite chapters of, uh, of Delusions of Crowds. And in that book, you start off with a story about John Law. You, you cite some history. John Law was from Scotland, early 18th century. Um, and you talk about the creation or evolution of paper money and trade. Uh, venture capital and speculative bubbles. Now, these seem to be motivated, at least in some cases, by government indebtedness uh, and later a ratcheting up of, uh, well, you could say enthusiasm or euphoria and greed among a wider and wider set of individuals, the participants. Uh, now, for those who are not familiar with the South Sea bubble and other contemporary scandals, contemporary to the 19th century, uh, could you briefly outline what happened there and is there a 21st century equivalent? Yeah, well, John Law was a genius. Uh, he was the basically the great, 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 great grandfather of today's credit-based economy. And say what you will about credit and indebtedness. Uh, if we didn't have credit debt, if we didn't have government bonds, uh, we'd be in very, very bad shape. Government wouldn't be able to finance worthwhile projects. Businesses wouldn't be able to get going. We'd be in a heck of a pickle. And that was the state of the world before John Law came on the scene. Now, John Law's problem was that he was the first person to do it. Uh, and he didn't realize, wasn't obvious at that point, what all the pitfalls and what you had to be careful uh, about. So what happened was, is he um, uh, chartered a company uh, called the Mississippi Company, or it had a much more complicated name than that, but it was colloquially, named, colloquially called the, uh, the Mississippi Company. Uh, and it bought up all of the French government debt and also issued shares in the company. And what the company's brief was, was to conduct trade with the New World, basically, uh, and the Indies. Uh, and it supposedly had a monopoly on it. Uh, and there were several problems uh, with that, prime among which is that France didn't control that trade. That trade was basically controlled by the Spanish. So they had issued a, mono a monopoly that was basically worthless. But the public didn't realize that. And the price of the shares of the company began to rise. And that began a self-sustaining bubble. As the price rose, more and more people wanted to get in on the action. Uh, and the price went higher and higher and higher. And you had a classic stock bubble. I was the first really about the first classic uh, stock bubble. There had been smaller ones before that. And this spread to London, where a very similar company, the South Sea Company, uh, was chartered to take over the British government did. And almost the identical thing happened almost simultaneously uh, with it. And it was just a classic stock bubble. Uh, and if you, you know, just change a few of the adjectives and the proper nouns, you could be reading about the tech bubble of the 90s, the same sort of insane behavior. So is that the mirror to the South Sea bubbles? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the South Sea bubble and the Mississippi in, in London and the Mississippi Company bubble in Paris were twin events. They occurred pretty much simultaneously. And in fact, the, the London uh, uh, event basically fed off the, uh, uh, the Paris event. The people in London were basically imitating what had been done in Paris. So do you, do you have a scale that you rate these on? Or perhaps that's not important to rank them, but uh, would you say the South Sea bubble was uh, impacted more individuals than the the late 90s? Uh, it was it, it was a society-wide uh, event that affected all strata of society, both in London uh, and uh, in, in, uh, in Paris. Now, the one thing that 
Kai got wrong is, uh, is that he wrote a chapter on, and it's the most famous chapter in the book, on the tool at Mania. Uh, and that was, of course, that occurred a century earlier in Holland, where these tulip bulbs, or actually the futures in the tulip bulbs, got bid up to insane uh, prices. Uh, and he also painted it as the same sort of society-wide uh, phenomenon that did occur uh, in London and in Paris, and later in the United States and Britain in multiple instances. But it turns out that, that he was wrong uh, about the Dutch episode. The Dutch episode really was very well localized and wasn't a society-wide phenomenon that just affected uh, some, some futures traders. Very good. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, my next question has to do with another chapter in your book. I love the title of this. It's called uh, Sunshine Charlie Misses the Point. Uh, at the start of that chapter, uh, you discuss uh, Samuel Insull uh, and the financial and historical uh, machinations, I guess is a good word for that, uh, that led to the 1929 stock market crash. Now, there are many decades between that. Uh, and you talk about the four Ps as necessary ingredients, uh, the promoters, the public, the press and the politicians. And I'm just wondering how these four categories, how do they work together to propagate mass illusion or bubbles? I mean, they're all just people, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm a physician. So, uh, I, I, you know, I, I look at things from the medical model. So I ask, you know, what's the pathophysiology? What's the underlying physiology of the disorder? And that has to do with, you know, the provision of credit uh, and, and fractional reserve system that was basically uh, invented by uh, some British people, and then law expanded uh, on. So that's the pathophysiology. Then there's the anatomy, and that's where the four Ps come in. It's what parts of the body or the body politic are involved. And so for starters, you have the promoters of these schemes. And they tend to be very charismatic people, people very much like, for example, uh, uh, Elon Musk. Uh, and, you know, Samuel Insull was the... Uh, was the, the, the earlier uh, 20th century reincarnation of Elon Musk in many regards. And then, you know, the, the great railway promoters of England in the 19th century. And then finally, you go all the way back to John Law. These are charismatic businessmen who capture the public imagination uh, and oftentimes do a lot of good. I mean, I, I think that John Law was a capitalist hero. Um, there was a guy by the name of George Hudson who basically built out much of Britain's railway network, but also generated an enormous bubble that destroyed the, uh, the, the health and well-being and finances of, of a lot of people. Samuel Insull uh, built basically a large part of our nation's electrical generating infrastructure, power companies. Uh, but he also was a financial charlatan who bankrupted uh, a lot of people. Uh, and I think that Elon Musk fits the uh, it's the same mold. The man is a genius. He's going to do a lot of wonderful things for society, but he may not do good things for his investors. Yeah, we seem to have no shortage of business evangelists uh, currently, or maybe it's because of the internet. They're just so much better known. I mean, before you had to pick up a copy of Time or U.S. News or the Wall Street Journal to learn about these people, but now it seems they're everywhere. Yeah. So, so you know, they're the obviously these people. Uh, uh, feed the population at large and prey on their naivete. Uh, but then there's the press uh, that, that lionizes these people. So, you know, 20 years ago, Jack Welch was on the cover of every financial magazine there was for his financial genius uh, at, uh, at General Electric. Well, what he was really doing was just shifting earnings around so it looked like the General Electric had this nice, smooth, rapid uh, increase of earnings when what he was really doing was, was fiddling, uh, fiddling uh, the books. And these people tend to become heroes until they're not. Uh, you know, insult just about wound up in jail, law just about wound up uh, in jail. Uh, Charlie Mitchell just about wound up in jail too, who was one of the progenitors of National City Corp, which was one of the uh, primary actors in the 29 crash. Right, and then, there's, and then later on, and just the turn of the last century, uh, Enron and WorldCom, and some people certainly went to jail during that, that period. Yeah, which was unusual. Most of these people wind up going to trial, but generally getting acquitted. Getting uh, off. People, except, except, except the people at Enron who were so egregious uh, that they, they couldn't escape the, uh, the legal grim, grim raper. Yeah, even brought down one of the big four accounting firms. Uh, pretty, pretty nifty stuff. Uh, great recent history. 
Uh, okay, I have another question for you. This one is uh, about the chapter you call Capitalism's Philanthropists. And this is just a story that you share uh, from uh, Jason Zweig that happened near the, the peak of the dot-com. Uh, uh, so early in 2000, I guess. Uh, apparently his cab was accosted by four, men, four young men in suits, expensive suits, and they tried to dislodge him by bribing the driver while he was still sitting in the cab with a hundred dollar bill just to drive them a few blocks. Uh, that was pretty entertaining. Uh, and you write, uh, they were rich and according to the logic of our materialistic society, thus smart and important, Never mind that their lucre more likely flowed from dumb luck, sharp practices, or both. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the logic of our materialistic society as it relates to our delusions. Yeah, Jason. Jason actually, the most amusing thing about that story is something he didn't he didn't write about, which was that you know if you are a resident of New Yorker and you know the neighborhood he's talking about, uh, hiring a cab to walk a few blocks is a fool's errand, you're, you're actually much better off just walking. So these, these guys were just you know, engaging in, in, in macho conspicuous uh, consumption. I lean very heavily in the book on evolutionary uh, psychology. Uh, and I basically subsume or subscribe to the view uh, that we're really just vehicles for our DNA. We're the servants of our DNA. So you know, a, a, a guy, a man, is just the sperm cell's way of making another sperm cell. All right, it's a way of propagating that DNA forward. And back in the day, in our hunter-gatherer past, the way you uh, sent DNA forward was by being a macho hunter and bringing back meat for the tribe. Uh, and that enabled you to get mates and for your DNA to go forward. Well, the, the, the modern equivalent of meat now is, is wealth. So the more wealth you can accumulate, uh, the more it stimulates uh, our, our evolutionary uh, roots and the better you are to, to attract mates and to propagate your DNA. Now, in the world of modern contraception, that doesn't happen, that gets short circuited. But the, 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 the evolutionary psychology drive is still, is still there. So that's why we lionize uh, people who are wealthy. It's just uh, the, 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 the post-industrial equivalent of the great hunter who brings home the meat for the tribe. Eat from the tribe. And, and I, I assume that you would widen this to females as well as males? Well, that, you know, I don't want to get into to gender politics here. The, the okay. optimal strategy for, but just, 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 to, just to just sort of dispose of it, the optimal strategy for a male is to spread his DNA as widely as he can, whereas the op optimal strategy for females who can't bear that many offspring is to focus instead on quality, which is where the status comes in. Uh, mate quality. Yeah, make yeah. make quality. In other words, the, the optimal female strategy is to pick the, the the mate who can bring home the most meat and enable her progeny to survive. So it's a, yeah. it's a different facet of the same thing. I, I would imagine some of that stuff has been turned on its head in uh, the most modern sense in the last fifty to seventy years. Uh, oh, yeah, that, that's that's the whole problem. And one of the things I talk about in the book is, is that we are are basically uh, operating in a space age with Stone Age minds. And it feeds directly into finance as well. Well, uh, my, my partner claims that I have a Stone Age mind. I'm not sure I agree with that, but uh, uh, everyone has to work those things out for themselves. We all, we all, every single one of us has a state, has a Stone Age mind. And that's what the book is about, is learning to recognize that and deal with it. I can tell you that my amygdala are especially informed, but I would be lying. <laughs> uh, one of my last questions is this. Uh, this this uh, is from your preface. Uh, Joel Greenblatt's, uh, sorry, Greenblatt's uh, variation on the uh, Galton experiment you talk about, uh, basically children guessing the number of jelly beans in a jar. And apparently the average of their individual guesses when they were performed in silence was much closer to the actual number than when they talked about it as a group and made those guesses out loud. Uh, and you're conclu you conclude the more group interacts the more it behaves like a real crowd and the less accurate its assessments become. And uh, I thought that was interesting observation, but it, it got me thinking since we're, we're in a group here now, how do we avoid the herd mentality that leads groups such as ours astray? 
Uh, basically, uh, the you know we are we are the ape that tells and listens to narratives. All right, when you know two Stone Age hunters went out uh, and tried to uh, uh, spear a mastodon, they didn't each issue each other mathematical vectors. Okay, instead one told the other, "You go right, I'll go left, and we'll spear the animal from both sides." We that's how we communicate. That's how we deal with the world is in narratives. And unfortunately, narratives don't do a very good job in finance. What does a very good job in finance is computation and knowing what the base rate is. Now, let me give you an example of, of how we get trade. Let's say someone were to ask me, what is the stock market going to do next year? Okay, What your overwhelming uh, um, uh, drive or instinct to do is talk, start talking about the Fed and inflation, uh, and, and, and consumer mentality uh, and what sectors you think are going to do best. It's to spin narratives, okay? Uh, and that's the road to financial oblivion. What you should be doing instead is looking at the base rate, okay? What is the average return, real return, what is the average return of stocks been historically? Well, it's seven or eight percent, all right? And that is probably about the most accurate estimate you're going to be able to give in any given year. Yeah. And so that's an example of that. In other words, ignore the narratives, go with the base rate. Okay, yeah, hard to do. It takes a bit of discipline, I think. Uh, well, mental it, discipline. It, it, takes, it, takes, it takes discipline because we are human and humans prefer narratives. Right, right. So maybe we could uh, make, the, make the data the narrative or somehow convert it. Uh, yeah, but it troubles it makes a very dull narrative. It's one of the things we've learned over the past, yeah. uh, you know, five or 10 years of social media is that the more lurid and false a narrative it is, the, the more wide, the more viral it goes, the more widely it spreads. Uh, the, I, I was just looking, reading last night, an article in The Economist on the virality of different uh, media. Uh, and uh, it turns out that the less accurate a media is, a media source is, the more viral it goes, the least viral, the, the, the least spread, the, the, the media that spread the least of all of their sources was ProPublica, okay, which has the most accurate and data-driven reporting. Yeah, interesting. Uh, th that would lead us to a number of different areas, and I don't think we'll have time to discuss any of them. Uh, but uh, yeah, the evolutionary psychology is something we've covered in this group uh, in, under the guise of various authors, including Jason Zweig. Uh, and uh, it's always enjoyable for me because there's there's so much to that. We're driven evolutionarily by uh, these uh, by these narratives, as you call them, and uh, un unfortunately not always informed by the prefrontal cortex. Uh, okay, my next question is this: uh, This is more specifically to do with your your body of work. Uh, you've written a number of highly regarded books on investing. Uh, do any of these books? need updating, excluding the market data and little things like that. Have you changed your mind about any of the pieces of advice that you promulgated when writing, for example, the four pillars for the asset almost, allocator? Yeah, almost, almost nothing. Uh, if I could change, if I could tell you to ignore one page from the four pillars of investing, it would be the table on page 72 where I list expected returns. Recall this book was written in 2002. Yeah. Uh, and I... I suggested that there would be real expected returns, uh, for example, for small value stocks of 7%, that is after inflation, that hit the nail right on the head. Uh, large US cap stocks, I said, were three and a half percent. That grossly undershot what actually uh, uh, happened. Uh, and, uh, and, and precious metals equity was, was, was a significant overestimate. But looking at all of these numbers and sort of averaging together Today, it, it you know it suggests that you're going to be able to get a zero to two percent return, a real return on bonds. Well, good luck with that. All right, uh, and then I also think that, that the average of all of those stock returns is also optimi over optimistic as well. And I suspect I'm going to get asked about that later on. So I'll defer. I'll defer that. The next thing is, is I was very optimistic about value stocks uh, back then. I'm still optimistic, but less so simply because there's so many other players in the field. All right, uh, you know, twenty, you know, twenty years ago, uh, very it was very hard actually to get real exposure to value stocks. 
now it's very easy to to get that exposure. Uh, yeah. and, and so the more people who know about it and the more people who can buy something, the more the prices get uh, driven up uh, uh, and the lower returns out. I, I still think there's a value premium. I don't think it's as large or as certain as it was. And then finally, I, I did write sort of a, um, a, um, a follow-on or an update of uh, that book, which is something I wrote five years ago, which is this one, Rational Expectations. Um, and I, I almost hesitate to flog my own books. You should only read this book if you like math, all right? And, and you read the first book, The Intelligent Asset Allocator, and you're looking, which is even older, and you're looking for an update. This is, this is a very mathy book. Uh, but this sort of updates everything that I wrote uh, about uh, in, um, in, in Four Pillars. I, I think there was one concept I left out of Four Pillars. It's the idea uh, of, of that, that the, 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 the person who is uh, in the accumulation phase, that is the young person who's in the accumulation phase of investing, is a very different animal from the person who is like me, who's in the decumulation uh, phase. In other words, young people should invest much more aggressively than geezers should. Uh, and that's hard for them to do, but it turns out that the risk of stocks for, to younger individuals is very low, all right? The, the risk of stocks to the average middle-aged person is fairly high, uh, and the risk of equity to, um, to, to older people uh, like me is very, very high. Now, that said, if you're really in good shape you're in, and you're, you're a geezer and you've got a lot of assets, you're really not investing for yourself. You're investing for generations down the line. But you, should, you certainly yeah. need a good slug of riskless assets to see it through five or 10 million years. I, I'm glad you made that last point uh, because I think that's true. A lot of people uh, underestimate their uh, time horizon. They think it's just their own lifetime but really, if they think about their spouse or their heirs, uh, we're talking about a much longer period. So maybe they should be, if they're well off and their expenses are covered, maybe they should be uh, extended. At, and I'm at 80 uh, percent, but I'm not spending down my portfolio even in retirement. So that's a, a different situation. Yeah. I mean, Gloria Steinem put it best, it's sort of, if a little crudely. Uh, she said that the, uh, the rich plan three generations ahead, the poor plan for Saturday night. <laughs> yeah yeah beer at 2 a.m at the at the local bar i got yeah. it uh, uh great thank you very much for those uh answers uh ne next question is uh, uh this is uh, something i've been thinking about i haven't really uh come to any conclusions but i i'm wary of a number of items and i bet you could uh, probably identify them for us and that is what are the the most dangerous memes um uh, that you see circulating today in the investment community? Well, a meme is by definition dangerous, all right? A, a meme by definition was a term coined, by the way, by the evolutionary, the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins right. uh, to describe a, a, uh, an idea or a narrative that propagates itself through virality. Uh, so almost all viral ideas are, are by their very nature dangerous. Uh, in finance, you do well by investing in things, you do best, I should say, by investing in things that no one else knows about. Uh, so, you know, if every time you, you get into an Uber car uh, and the driver talk, starts talking to you about crypto uh, or about GameStop, uh, then you know that, that, you know, that's an area you should be avoiding. So almost anything that you can identify, uh, you know, as a meme, whether it's GameStop or Kathy Woods, or cryptocurrency, uh, by definition, almost by definition, is something that's dangerous from a financial point of view. I was trying to think of a meme that uh, isn't dangerous, and I'm sure we could come up with a couple, but maybe not in the financial sector. I don't know. Um, okay, that's that's interesting. You mentioned a few of the buzzwords that uh, could be thrown out in questions. Uh, a lot of people are wondering about cryptocurrency. Some uh, even experienced bogleheads are hedging their bets and buying a little here and there, but I don't think they're taking a serious position uh, in any of those things. Uh, yeah. Now, there, factors are there, different. There were also bogleheads back in the 90s who invested in tech stocks. So yes, right. the, uh, bogleheads, are, bogleheads are a remarkably well-informed group of people, but, but even you know, bogleheads, and I'm a boglehead, occasionally make mistakes too. 
Right. Well, I guess if you were in the growth sectors in the late 90s and you and not too focused, not too concentrated and just did a hold until now, you'd be OK again. Right. After the last 10 years. Yeah, it's very true that had you invested in, for example, the Dow Jones Internet Index in 1999, uh, you would have gotten pretty much replicated the return of the S&P 500. The only problem being that along the way, you lost 95 percent of your money. And uh, you know, yeah. I show a graph, actually. I, actually, I, I think I, a graph of that almost went into this book, but uh, it, it didn't. Uh, and, you know, it shows a graph of the, of the two intersecting you know, in the present day. But to me, it's the graph of the, of the, of the internet index uh, is, is kind of a fiction because I don't believe there are any sentient beings in this quadrant of the galaxy that actually invested in tech stocks all the way from 1999 to the present day. Yeah, I, I think you're right. They, they would have to be someone, uh, or maybe, maybe this is apocryphal, but they have to be one of those fidelity clients, i.e. dead. Uh, right. Right, right. <laughs> okay, I'd like to sum up with, a, with just a, an open-ended uh, question and just ask you if you could tell us one thing that you know for sure. Well, uh, I, I know that you know human nature is not going to change. Uh, the evolutionary process is way too slow, uh, and because of our love of narratives and our primarily our primary. Uh, 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 Evo psych characteristic, which is our ability to imitate our, our proclivity to imitate imitate other people. I think we're going to see manias and panics uh, from now out to the horizon. We're going to experience them regularly, and to be out on the, be on the lookout for them. Yeah.